community collaboration. Um, now I would, I'm you. very yes. excited yes. to introduce you all to Mickey Metz from Agaric Web Development Cooperative. Mickey Somehow. has been an amazing member of the local free software community and really the global free software community. But every now and then I, I subscribe myself to a new email list and I'll notice very quickly that there's a message from Mickey on it already and that she's already <laughs> engaged in everything that's going on oh, no. and taking an active role. And <laughs> I find that inspiring and impressive. So let Thanks. us now all allow ourselves to be inspired by Mickey. <laughs> Thanks. I'm just nosy. I'm just nosy, nosy, nosy. My dad used to say, she doesn't take naps because she's too nosy. And he was right. <laughs> so now I'm going to put my glasses on. This is my other me. The one I reject. I keep losing them. You know, anyway. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank everyone for making this event possible each year. The FSF staff, and the volunteers are amazing. They put this all together. It's like a whirlwind and it all comes together and everyone just does their thing. Um, they do an amazing job raising awareness of this movement. And uh, as uh, Molly said, I'm a member of Agaric. We're a web development cooperative and we are distributed on three continents. And uh, the rest of the stuff is there. Um, I'm going to present some issues as I see them and reveal how I was introduced to my personal power and why enabling others' personal power matters um, because I could not figure out a way to do this without just telling you what my circumstances are and maybe you can relate something in your life and work this puzzle for yourself. And. Um, there are cookies here for after the event. I'll, I'll just show them. I baked them at, to reflect the audience. So you'll have to take one that you resonate with. <laughs> yes. Oh, I have to go way over here. Because I also have, if you sneak around back in the uh, small area, there are other cookies baked like not the audience. <laughs> okay. We hope these balance out someday. Um, so here we go. We're living in a society, as you all know, that uh, as individuals, power seems out of our control and in the hands of those who can distribute information swiftly and widely, or they can refuse to distribute information at all. Is in the hands of corporations whose algorithms now sort us into filter bubbles and categorize our every action. National governments track everything we type or say globally, like using PRISM, Echelon, and even worse, the local police invade our privacy with devices like Stingray, a cell phone tracker. And we may build our own profiles online but we do not have access to the meta profile made by the corporate servers that our queries traverse as we navigate online, purchasing goods and services, as well as logging into sites where we have accounts. Well, no matter what we do, uh, we're tracked, we're categorized as a threat or a non-threat. What comprises a threat? How could you be a threat? Well, Eric Lundgren has been jailed for redistributing software that was already freely available online. I am not saying it was free software. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But uh, it was freely available for download. So things can change. Ah, so if you're not sure that you're a part of a social group, then I can assure you you're not. <laughs> The status in a social group is usually related to material possessions and symbolic power in a capitalist society. Symbolic power would be something like uh, an inheritance of a corporate entity while having no practical experience running a company and therefore the other people do the work. And in a title, you're now the boss of everyone, or are you? Well, inside, you know you're not qualified 
you have to. <laughs> and you either rise to the occasion or insert your favorite public corporate failure story. And uh, more about titles later. So uh, we're being herded into having one point of entry, one aspect of failure when using single sign-on type uh, services that make it so convenient we can't resist. Our one Google account will grant us access to the rest of the world and the content we're seeking. It'll connect us with our friends. We loathe passwords and security PIN numbers that seem to merely block access to our own devices and utilities which ultimately blocks us from our loved ones. If you lose your Facebook account and then you can't contact anyone because you don't know their phone number, you don't know their email address, you just know them through Facebook even though it's your aunt, you know. <laughs> How does that happen? Yet we expect to have privacy when searching the internet for health remedies and solutions to personal problems. The targeted advertisements are easy to, you know, just let them go, ignore them, but we fail to understand the consequences of them showing up on the web pages we visit. When we finally know that the convenience was not meant for us, it's way too late and the platform owner has complete control. And if your posted content is not to their liking, with a flick of one switch, out goes your light. So why would people acquiesce to a corporation gathering their most private thoughts and recording them? Uh, I believe that most people fail to heed the call for privacy because they feel so small and so alone and will people you know, point me out, will I be targeted and put in a certain group? And the response to privacy protectors becomes, I have nothing to hide. Well, this attitude is great for the corporations <laughs> as they need social control to guide us in more than just buying options. It's aimed at directing our every action and interaction that we undertake online and offline. So, one significant dis difference in the human condition is that a person without capital can be tied to bad choices from lack of options and low level of education, yet the wealthy are bound to their fate by proxy, their relatives, their inheritance, the pecking order of their family tree. Has anyone here ever been threatened with being disowned or having your legacy denied and given to your sibling? or worse yet, a more distant relative or a stranger. To be cut off from your family has different implications between rich people and poor people, but the outcome is usually the same. A person loses touch with their personal power through disapproval. To have power of any kind, it must reflect on something or someone that you believe is more powerful than you are. For it to be real, and for most people, it's family that they must please. But this can be attached to anyone that you feel is important. And there's a disparity in the educational system that I've noticed since I moved to Boston. I was raised in Connecticut, and I moved here in the 70s, and I realized people did not have a large vocabulary, people that came from certain areas of Boston. I was wondering, wow, the school system is that drastically different? That's amazing. But there's certain areas that have notoriously low standards for passing students. And it's reflected in the jobless population and the sense of despair in affected communities. Many people I meet in these areas are resigned to accept the low standard of living while their home is literally in the shadow of an Ivy League college. Like this one. Oh. Some think... <laughs> <laughs> Some think they will not live past the age of 25 due to the enforced crime and violence in their community. And I say enforced because some criminal behavior is perpetuated by arcane laws and untamed predictive policing used on community members. And by enforced crime, I refer to the areas of a city that are depressed financially with no opportunities and for the citizens to work, they have to go outside their community usually. So locals go through a revolving door between prison system and their neighborhoods. 
And this becomes a model path for younger generations to repeat. Enter despair. The schools in these neighborhoods usually do not have funding to provide a robust learning atmosphere. While most universities in this area and other areas have billions of dollars in endowment funds. Where do these funds go? Who is in control of these funds? Why are they not helping the community? I thought they were nice. No, anyway. <laughs> they looked nice. No. The for-profit private system is working though. And as long as private prisons fill beds, the corporation is making a profit. And who should be ashamed of this? Did I say billions? No. It is our silence an agreement to carry on with business as usual? It used to be hidden, but now anyone can look into the workflow of the gentrification of an area and pricing the workers out of a neighborhood. And they can't buy land, they can't build anything, but we're built, I mean, we as the city, but we all voted for this, yeah, to build more luxury housing and private property for um, students and tourism. So I'm shocked at the number of Bostonians that do not know where MIT is even located, as I ask them on the street. I'm not shocked at how intimidated people can feel by buildings like MIT and what they represent to someone without any formal education opportunities or any formal education, really. It's, it's, yeah, it's. <laughs> so you do not belong here is implied and posted everywhere, but only visible to the disenfranchised. Um, a lot of people in this room won't see that sign unless they really look for it. They're like, what? This is an open room, it's all good. But, uh, so it's, it, those of us who grew up in a society that nurtured personal power, we're not gonna see these signs. You really have to dig and look for them. So where does personal power come from? And who am I? And why does it, my input matter to you? Well, it really doesn't, but I, I'm trying to let people know what happened to me, but maybe it can happen to them. I do what I love to do all day long. And, and I think a lot more people could do that. So uh, see if you remain symbolically wealthy, you have to flaunt your symbolic capital. And this is played out in corporations and within our families, if you take a look at it. Until we address this uh, structure on the family level, it cannot be addressed in society. Big Brother has many meanings, some literal. And most importantly, we must disregard this hierarchical labeling system that is foisted upon us at birth. And it's in every level of society. But I encourage you to be rebellious. Don't listen to that. It's uh, to be recognized by people whose values they do not know and eager to wield the symbolic power the title holds. That is a sad person. And it is silly to bestow titles on people in a symbolic power play, thus giving them a status that is hard to control if they have no personal power. So without a sense of self-worth and a symbolic title, it's easy to become corrupted by the symbolic power bestowed upon you. Titles lead to a misconception, not only of oneself, but of the roles others play, unless they are just for the benefit of a job description, like teller of stories, fixer of bugs, things like that. Developers hold the, um, this in their realm because they are part of the building blocks of freedom. These are what I believe it will take to build a more free world. We need free software. Everything needs free software. You can see it's the bottom slide, I mean the bottom image. Uh, we need a solidarity economy where everyone is looking after everyone else. We're not trying to gain for ourselves only. Uh, we need cooperative platforms, platforms we build together and that we own together, like an Uber that's owned by the drivers. Um, and of course, personal power plays a huge role in doing any of this. So if we look today at the market economy, 
um, developers, developers hold a crucial position and movements need the combined efforts of technical and non-technical people. So as people, we forget that we have a rich history of making change through collective bargaining. Throughout history, change has been made, made by people demanding it together, not just one person or five people. Together, we must all stand up and say things together. There are campaigns now to stop building spyware for agencies like ICE and, and they abuse power over citizens. So um, there's a campaign like tech won't build it, it's hashtag tech won't build it, where we are discussing the responsibilities of technical workers in groups like the Tech Workers Coalition and Radical Connections Network, which was just formed to serve the needs of people who have radical sites that they want to maintain and put online. So how many of us are working on projects that you know will abuse the average user? Ah, I see a couple of hands, yeah. So how many of us are working on projects that may be abusing users and we do not know it because no one has raised the question? Every person needs to raise their hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, it's an issue. The question has not even been raised. So um, what does abusing the users mean? Who could be adversely affected um, by a software or impacted by a design. When a project includes the community from the start, you can attain design justice. So design justice, what is that? That involves including the community in your designs, plans, development projects from the start. Before you touch that pencil to the paper, talk to people people that will actually be living with the software or whatever it is that is built, whether it's a building or a house or a, you know, software. So sometimes corporations, corporations do this, but they only do it, it seems, to maxi maximize a profit, not to get the best deal for the community. So, well, I had a really rough childhood, growing up surrounded by criminals and carn artists, and there were also some very nice folks <laughs> caught up in the political drama that ensconced the citizens of a small town filled with high-level evildoers that masqueraded as benevolent bestowers of love and friendship. Most of these people we're using symbolic power with statements like, I am the son of so-and-so, or I have a certificate in such-and-such, -such, or I have some proximity to someone with power. And I believe this way of thinking leads to a gradual loss of our own personal power, if we had it to begin with. We exchange our power for a title in which we find value. And if there's enough symbolic power, then that turns into pseudo-currency with perks. So there's no way to uh, get away from having perks, right? Uh, roots and anchors are important. And when visualizing your own support network, and, there, and so are the people that surround you when your first impressions of self and position enter your own perception. Who am I to others? Who do I appear to be to others? Most of the same hundred students that I started in first grade with went through graduation with me. Um, so we all get a pretty solid reflection of who we are and how we fit into a picture. And in my town, we're all programmed to be leaders. These were the sons and daughters of influential people that would become heir to vast family fortunes and yet talking about these resources and fortunes as, um, and what part they play in the big picture was not the thing to do. No. So is it uncool to walk around saying you're the heir to a sizable standard oil portfolio? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's been in your family for generations. No, I haven't seen someone saying that. 
but is it okay to say that you have failed miserably because you are heir to a dysfunctional system that favors people unlike yourself? Well, I do hear some people saying that, but we gotta get that first sentence out there. <laughs> so Westport and Weston, Connecticut was home to me in the 60s and 70s, and also to many political fundraisers. People thought it was the, F, you know, the place where they could raise lots of money for their candidate. And it was also home to kingpin, kingpins of the entertainment industry and pharmaceutical companies that destroyed many of my upscale friends and their families through bogus prescriptions, including medication for like uh, financially induced mental maladies, like malaise. Anyone got malaise? <laughs> I'm down with the malaise, I'll be up later. Yeah. <laughs> if you've seen the movie The Stepford Wives, you've seen my town. It was written about it. In my school experience, there were no visible students with low self-esteem. Everyone was doing good and on the surface, and everyone was welcome to be a part of the essential conversation. So upon my exit, I chose to leave college offers on the table. Um, well, in my town, college offers were, we're having dinner with the dean on Thursday. You'll be there, right? Okay, you'll wear your best Sunday clothes. You know. That, not in my family, but my friends. My, my parents knew since I was little I didn't want to go to school and be a part of this whole, <laughs> the whole thing, no. So, but yeah, many of my friends had dinner with the dean <laughs> and passed a napkin back and forth with a number on it. So I chose to leave that all on the table and experience a world without a safety net because it seemed vital and exciting to me. What could I do? What, what can I do with my life? Well, people laughed, but I, I was just saying, I, I just got to do stuff. <laughs> so I found creative things to do for work, such as drag racing, working on foreign cars with my friend Willie at his father's garage. So one night, a fleet of Nazi staff cars were delivered to the garage at like two in the morning. What did we do? We jumped in them and drove around town. It was like oh my God, this is so much fun. And uh, then it's like they had the insignias and swastikas emblazoned on them. It's like we all had no idea of the implications of pain we could have caused, sure. Well, that was my eye opener. I was 17 and I knew I had been lured into entitlement. When I had sat in offices in the late 60s with Madison Avenue advertising execs who were la laughing at the money, they would make from selling ridiculous fashions that hippies were making from items found in dumpsters. I did not realize then that they were more excited about the control they could have on people purchasing their products and the self-categorizing people would do with these fashions. It came to public awareness in a documentary, um, The Merchants of Cool. It was produced in 2001 by our friend Douglas Rushkoff. And uh, he is also a member of the platform cooperativism movement that I am also a part of today. And that's about building platforms owned by the people. So I did not know exactly what I was hearing then, but I knew it had something to do with, uh, with my childhood and um, things I had seen manifest. So my childhood experiences led me to a grand conclusion, sitting in a mansion with everything material that I ever dreamed of and wished for is a task so dull that a billion dollar pharmaceutical industry rose up to help the depressed masses suffering from wealthy capitalism and their emotionally downtrodden offspring. People without material assets and people with material assets may be depressed by the same things but from different perspectives. They both suffer from the lack of education, the wealthy by choice, Companion choices, wealthy have too many candidates, unwanted children, silent religion, air rebellion, career choices. The wealthy also have a lot of drunken buddies like us, but they have seed money. Lack, <laughs> lack of skills, <laughs> and the wealthy spent time sailing, golfing, and playing tennis, and um, didn't get skills, but 
training of value is looked upon as uh, that's for people without money. They must get skills. So the, um, not many people that come from a wealthy family can cope with being disowned, as it would probably mean the combination of a low-income social services job after attaining a liberal arts degree, um, low sociocentric information, like they've been watching TV series and not knowing what's going on in the community or in the world, and a life that seems like a long, dark highway full of tolls. And the worst part about that is you have to appear happy as you drive through the tolls. All right, so who are the developers that are working on facial recognition and spyware? If this is such a great thing, we should all know their names, right? And they should be out going, I'm developing spyware. It's going to know all about you. Isn't that great? Dude, I didn't know. That's kind of like the standard oil shareholder guy. He's not out there saying that. I never heard anyone say that people died and my stock went up. No, <laughs> I don't think so. So is your income aligned with your values? Well, I think we need to update minds as well as we need to update the code. So does your company um, encourage discussion between peers and the whole team or the whole company? If not, why not? Can you help to change this? Getting involved in discussing values and goals with other coders, it's probably not in the interest of a corporation, but it's probably how free software is going to bubble up into the conversation and you'll have some great talks with your co-developers that you didn't even know were um, into free software. So, there it is. This is what we all know, right? Everybody knows this slide, the four freedoms by our friend, whoops, oh, my mouse, <laughs> by our friend Richard Salmon. And the four freedoms are something I am bringing to the platform cooperativism movement. I don't know if anyone has seen this book. It's called um, Hours to Hack and to Own. Thank you. This mouse, it, I think it's real, it gets away. <laughs> Always comes back though. Happy little mouse. Did it turn itself off? No. <laughs> that would be something. So the other thing, why are they secret about it if it is so good? So if your income is aligned with your values, then you're probably enjoying that. And I, you know, if, as long as you're working with free software, great. And if you're not, of course, we know you will bring that up. So as a way to get involved, my worker-owned cooperative, Agaric, hosts a weekly show and tell. This is something you can do. We just get a, a Jitsi chat room, video chat, and every week on Wednesday at 11, we invite developers from all over the world to come in and do lightning talks. Well, this turned into us connecting with a lot of people globally, and we've recently connected with some co-ops in Argentina who have come up with a fantastic method and process for us to share work between cooperatives. And um, it, it's amazing. You can see a uh, video of it on uh, the Agaric website. And recently, the Platform Cooperative Movement, which also has a consortium, has been granted a million dollars to develop a platform cooperative toolkit. And you can see that here. Nothing in it is really software but it will have software to wrap around it and websites, et cetera. So movements must be global as what goes on here eventually turns up over there or vice versa. And neighborhoods around the globe are now being militarized and the news is not even getting out to us in regards to what is happening. So why do some developers believe that intrusive and malicious code they write or contribute to will not ever affect them? Eh. Are we like the Egyptians who dig the graves and they get shoved into them and then the other guys get shoved in and the, soon, like, who knows about it? No one? Uh, I don't know, but I think we should work on figuring that out. It's um, much like when the stars go dark on the internet, 
when you receive your, achieve your single sign-on, your one point of entry, your Google, Facebook thing, and then the machine shuts you down. You will not likely be missed by many, and you'll have little or no recourse on getting your uploaded assets back. Um, we've heard of people that have lost all their family pictures, their whole collection of work, um, everything that they've worked for for years, and there's nothing they can do. So the movement of platform cooperativism came out of the new school in New York City. It's led by Trevor Schultz, and he's the one that um, he and Nathan Schneider edited this book and compiled, oh, about 35 or more authors to each contributor chapter, and it has really small chapters that you can read and get an insight into this movement. Um, I'll have some books um, that I can sell after it, after we leave the thing, and also the cookies will be there. So you don't have to buy a book, you can just eat a cookie, <laughs> and it won't follow you around for long. Right. <laughs> So um, there's many projects being built um, with platform cooperativism, and many are underway. At their, if you go on their website or any of the um, other connecting websites, you can see a directory of projects that are happening, and you know they, we're more than welcome to having people, technical and non-technical, come into the uh, project. So what is the difference between personal power and entitlement? Personal power comes from knowing who you are and being able to act based on your values and ethics. Entitlement comes from thinking you know who you are and thinking you're more powerful and believing it, internalizing it, and acting on it in ways that deny others privilege. Through advertisements and societal programming, we're more likely to make enemies than friends when going about our daily routines now. It's like we may have empathy as individuals, but in small groups, um, we've been known to take joy in someone else's failure, kind of like a giant schadenfreude, you know, world now, and it's become a bonding point for many people. And, but that would take another day-long talk. So entitlement is an attitude and a pretense of superiority. There's many community projects like Cooperation Jackson. Has anyone heard of Cooperation Jackson? No. All right, well, listen up. No. <laughs> They've come up with a whole plan and outline to uplift the community um, using land trusts and worker-owned cooperatives to work on the land, and it's called the Jackson Cush Plan. This can be transferred to different cities and applied anywhere. Apply liberally and, no. <laughs> so I, I would suggest you do a little searching and search for Cooperation Jackson. They're in Mississippi where if they can change things there, I think we'll have an easy time. <laughs> They've already done the um, heavy lifting for us. So great software starts with a greater understanding of people's needs. So in doing something like the Cooperation Jackson Plan, it all starts with talking. Um, so there's a local group called the Boston Ujima Project, and they're working to strengthen the bond between community members and uh, facilitating groups that have a goal such as working with anchor institutions to make long-term vendorship relationships. Why should um, Boston Hospital have Panera uh, instead of the local people? Um, there is no reason. So these are the people that enabled my personal power first and foremost, my mom and dad and my brother. And um, it was just wonderful that they were there when I came over. <laughs> so this is the reason I got on the internet. This is my very first band and in 1996 I was telling people I'm going to get on the internet so that the record execs in LA can see my band without me having to fly there. So <laughs> this is what got me there and brought me to meet you. So the, one of the last things I have to say is networks and movements 
need to work together. Movements need to work together. You need to find your own personal entry into the movement. There are no doors. We all make the doors and be sure to make them for other people. And this. So I ask that you consider having an open mind and be able to look beneath the surface. Listen carefully to the needs of community and engage members in the building of whatever it is you're doing from the start. And those without internet access will be severely inhibited from taking part in society as they already are. So we have to re a real lot of work to do and it's just um, never ending work. I'm really glad to see how many people are engaged in it. And today it means you get to be uh, less health care if you're not on the internet, less work and um, less information. So it's becoming imperative to our survival. So if programmers have people's best interests at heart, we can't go wrong. If we have free software to back up that, we surely can't go wrong. So to know that those interests are, and what they are, we have to talk to people that we do not know. I encourage you to go to rooms you don't go to. Go to a bingo game tonight. Do something you know, crazy. Go to a, a library uh, event, not at the library, because it's quiet there and you can't talk. <laughs> or in there, you know, wherever there's an event that you think, who the heck would be there? you and that's how we can change it because getting to know people's hearts and getting to our own heart will help us enable other people's personal power and you cannot act on anything if you're not acting from your own personal power you're just lost so thank you very much for not being lost opened until everyone is done here. <laughs> Not one cookie. So, don't go yet. Don't go yet. Oh, oh, oh okay. I didn't know there was time. There's great. There's time for one question. There's time what? for one question and we know who has it. Why did we stop so late that not to leave time for a response? Anyway, yes. Uh, it's not everything is tracked. It's the mic. Not everything is tracked. We have choices to make to reduce how much we are tracked. I make a lot of those choices. I'm tracked a lot less than most of you and much less than most people because I decide not to do a lot of the things that get tracked. So let's not exaggerate. You know, it's a hard fight and things are going mostly against us, but people are getting revved up to fight back. Let's not make it sound as if that battle were totally lost already. Oh, it's not. Well, That's why we're but the here. point is, not everything is tracked by those companies. Not yet, and we can resist it. But the next point is, I'm sad to say that platform cooperativism has, while it's good in some ways, has made a terrible wrong turning uh, we know what an Uber controlled by drivers would look like because there already was one and probably still is in Austin. The city of Austin, Texas kicked out Uber and Lyft uh, for a while and drivers yes. made their own similar platform and I'm sure it paid drivers better but That's it oppressed the, the customers in exactly the same ways and maybe even worse because there's a nasty contract they had to agree to. So yes. just worker control by itself does not respect freedom and this is the crucial point that is missing from the platform cooperativism idea. So if you're gonna have anything to do with it, please work hard to, push into that movement and bring up at every opportunity. Worker control is not enough. You must vow to respect our freedom and privacy, allow anonymous use.
don't make us run non-free programs to talk to your platforms, non-free yes. JavaScript it is. That is why we are here. That is why we are members of the Free Software Foundation, because we must bring our message, the message, to other communities that don't quite get it. They're almost there, but they don't quite get it yet. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. See, I answered all the questions. I know everything now. Yes. Yay. Here you are to save the day. <laughs> oh, you'll have to look that up. But it's not, it, it's not online. I'm protecting our privacy, man. <laughs> we didn't have cameras back in the 70s yeah, and the 80s. <laughs> We did, but they were used for other things. Yes. Thank you, guys. I love the work we all do together. Thank you. So before everyone leaves, there are a few more bits of housekeeping to handle. Um, could, where's Ruben? Can you switch the slides? Yay. I say one more brief thing? No. <laughs> well, because you've been talking to me about Ujima and their unfortunate choices in their websites. Yes. If free software yeah. people are going to get involved with Ujima, one thing you can do is leave. If free software people are going to get involved with Ujima, one thing you can do is lead that organization to stop making its websites impose non-free software on them and on other people. <laughs>